Okay, well, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this event. My name is Jonathan White and I'm Professor of Politics at the European Institute of the LSE. And I'm very pleased to be chairing this event on the politics of the far right in Central and Southeast Europe. This is uh, an event which is co-hosted by the uh, Ratio Forum within the Central and Southeast Europe program at LSE Ideas. And today we're looking at right-wing authoritarian politics as it arises in a number of countries in the region, what unites it, and also what unites the critique of it. Is there a coherent ideology which underpins far-right politics and perhaps even extends beyond the far-right to encompass other strands of politics in, uh, in the region? Uh, where does it draw its appeal from and what are the responses that it does attract and indeed should attract? How uh, should it be approached? These are some of the questions that we'll be looking at in today's discussion and also how the politics of a particular part of Europe feeds into uh, wider, more global trends to do with authoritarianism and the, the far right in Europe and beyond. We've got uh, today four expert uh, speakers to, to tackle these themes. And before we uh, kick off, I shall uh, just say a few words about, uh, about who we've got. Uh, we've got, first of all, Dr. Luke Cooper, who's a uh, consultant, associate researcher at LSE Ideas. He's the author uh, of a new report on uh, exactly this topic on authoritarian protectionism in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe, and also of a book which I believe is coming out around about now on authoritarian contagion, the global threat to democracy. Uh, our second speaker is Biljana Gyarova Vegetseder, who's one of the founders of the Bulgarian Institute for Legal Initiatives and is its current director of the foundation. Before this she worked as a senior staff attorney at the American Bar Association Central and Eastern European Law Initiative. Our third speaker is uh, Rafael Pankowski, who's professor at the Institute of Sociology of Collegium Civitas in Warsaw. And uh, Rafael has published widely on racism, nationalism, populism, xenophobia, and other issues, uh, including books such as Neo-Fascism in Western Europe, Racism and Popular Culture, and the populist radical right in Poland. And our fourth speaker today is going to be uh, Luisa Slavkova, who's director of the Sofia Platform Foundation. Uh, she's an advisory board member of the European Network for Civic Education. And in 2021, she co-founded the Pan-European Platform for Civic Education, the Civics Innovation Hub. She's also the author and editor of several books and publications on foreign policy, democracy, development, and civic education. So these are the four speakers that we've got for the event this afternoon. I'll say a few words briefly before we start about the, the format. Uh, we shall let each uh, speaker give an opening intervention of around about seven or eight minutes to, uh, to frame the discussion on their terms. Uh, once we've been through all our speakers, we'll then go back to our uh, our speakers uh, in order to allow them to uh, comment on uh, the interventions of other speakers and we'll start a something of a panel discussion in that fashion and then later on in the uh, in the course of the event we've got time for a Q&A session when we will be welcoming interventions from you the audience. Uh, a few final uh, reminders one is the event is being recorded and will be made into a podcast uh, secondly, if you want to tweet, then the hashtag is, uh, I believe it's on uh, a slide that you will have seen when you came in. It's the hashtag LSE Ratio Forum. Uh, and as I say, if you want to participate in the Q&A that's coming uh, later on, then just use the, the, the Q&A function on the, uh, on the Zoom platform. Okay, great. I think that's uh, everything I, I need to say just to, to frame things. So let's go over to our first speaker, which is going to be Luke Cooper. Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan, hi, everyone. 
Um, so I guess my take on what we're talking about today is uh, leaning in a way heavily into the description of the event is the way in which the far right rhetoric has become normalized among elites. And this isn't just a central eastern and southeastern uh, issue, it's a global um, phenomena. And I'll come back at the end at what I think is the real, to talk about what I think is the real uh, significance of what's happening in central eastern and southeastern Europe for tackling this global um, phenomenon. And uh, on the other hand, I think we're seeing across the region uh, a kind of flowering of civic resistance to this politics that we want to talk about. And so, uh, yeah, as Jonathan says, I've got a book out this week and I've also written a report for LSE Ideas, which will be published shortly. And it looks at um, political events and elite discourses in six different states, uh, the report does, that is. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, alongside the perhaps more widely talked about examples of Hungary and Poland. And it tries to identify a set of commonalities uh, within elite discourses within these countries and commonalities of resistance. So in choosing these case studies, um, that I think we're going to get a chance to discuss some of them in a bit more depth this afternoon, I think has um, two particular effects and advantages, if you like. Uh, the first is it helps us to de-exceptionalise this issue. I don't know, I, I suppose I approached this question um, in a way that was recognising certainly the significance of what's happening in Hungary and Poland, um, but wanted to really, especially amongst the EU elite, if you like, challenge um, the idea that the European Union's illiberalism problem is just a Hungarian and Polish issue and nothing else. Um, I think we need to, as academics, push back on that idea quite strongly and really draw out the commonalities that exist not only in Europe but also globally in how authoritarian politics is being uh, manifested. And, and in doing so, you know, really draw out the extent to which democracy is being challenged um, all over the world. Um, secondly, I think these cases are really helpful in that regard, um, because it reveals how the normalisation of far-right politics is both ideologically coherent, because many of the same discourses are being used all over the place, frankly, um, and then also perhaps paradoxically point out that even though it's got this very high level of ideological um, coherence, um, it's also something that we uh, find examples of on the left of politics or the centre left, the political centre and the centre right and far right. And I think this tells us the success that the far right has had in normalising many of their ideas. So politics that would have once been seen on the fringes of European and global politics has really come increasingly into the mainstream and can be found across the whole political spectrum formally defined. And this is what I call in the book um, authoritarian protectionism. And I've used this as a simple rubric to understand and group together, if you like, these tendencies and practices that we find um, in the new authoritarian politics. And I think, so authoritarian protectionism offers a very strong definition of the national community on ethnic lines, and usually some kind of sharp distinction to groups deemed as foreign outsiders or their social liberal cosmopolitan supporters, um, often using masculine imagery and rejecting to different degrees a social liberal agenda. And it moves quite quickly or easily from this, discour discur this discursive uh, idea to uh, saying, on the other hand, that these group, this ethnically defined nation, the true patriotic and legitimate members of the community, well, they have partisan interests, interests as a group that are counterposed to others. And this becomes quite a dangerous move for democratic politics, because it basically rejects the need for any form of um, pluralism. So if members of the insider group believe that their partisan interests have a, an absolute primacy over and above all other considerations, political leaders may well be able to persuade them, and I indeed I think this has happened, um, to attack uh, democratic um, institutions. 
And one further result of this is that um, it leads into a set of governing practices because it encourages power to be used autocratically without the respect uh, that democracy needs for the rule of law and fair political uh, competition. And we see these tendencies very widely across uh, these cases that the monitoring and regulatory functions of public institutions are often challenged in favor of patronage, clientelism, and excessive uh, centralization. This might involve um, coercing the media or subjecting it to some form of state interference and oligarchic patronage. And this means as a result of these governing practices that either, as, uh, either due to conscious design or um, a consequence of eroding the rule of law, then you're gonna get corruption. You're gonna get economic corruption and a blurring of distinction between the public and private sphere. So a very strong link to uh, crony uh, capitalism. So rule of law crises, a challenge to fair political competition, but not thankfully and importantly, or not yet anyway, the, the full overthrow of democracy. So it's what Shalini Randiria has also called a kind of soft authoritarianism. So the cases I've examined and uh, looked at for the report, I looked at Romania, uh, the Social Democrats associated with Livu Dragny and Victor Ponta, uh, regimes that have now fallen from power, a regime that has fallen from power as a result of mass protest. Uh, Robert Fico in Slovakia, another a very, very authoritarian experience that European Europe has had and should talk more about. Again, um, mass protests brought about uh, his fall from power over corruption. So those are forces aligned with the political left, but we also have seen Babis um, and his ally, uh, President uh, Milos Seaman uh, in the Czech Republic uh, that came to power on an anti-corruption, uh, pro-citizen rights agenda, at least in Babis's case, uh, but has governed very, in a very corrupt way. He's a billionaire, uh, really blurring the distinctions uh, between um, public and private sphere. Again, we've seen mass protests in that case, but not successful uh, this time. So on the left and on the centre, we see these practices. Uh, we've also seen um, in Bulgaria too, uh, the Borisov regime, regime that is governed in alliance with um, the far right uh, since 2017. And these cases all exist alongside the more um, commonly talked about examples in Hungary and Poland. I think there are a series of common threads we can see across these cases, cases. Uh, a gender scare over the Istanbul Convention, uh, sweeping attacks on sex education, abortion rights, and the freedoms of the LGBT plus community, and most recently, of course, in Hungary in this regard, but it's a really common tendency. Uh, we see ethno-nationalist rhetoric, especially in reference to Muslim immigration during the migration crisis and the Roma community. We also see some use of some kind of conspiracy theory, uh, maybe the construction of alternative ecosystems of ideas through online communities that serve to radically challenge the truthful reporting of events. And we also see, yes, that corruption and patronage politics, that power uh, centralization. So uh, I'll, I'll just finish by saying two um, further things. Um, on the one hand, uh, in we, we shouldn't exceptionalize these cases. So there's a really strong European context here. And we have to be clear, I'm afraid, that the European Union has created a very tolerant um, environment internationally for the emergence of authoritarian politics over the last 15 years. The example I would use to draw this out would be uh, the 2006 suspension of uh, the Robert Fico from the Party of European Socialists. He was readmitted two years later um, and he was suspended over uh, going into alliance with the far right Slovak National Party. Now that event I think really foreshadows um, the, the uh, tolerant atmosphere created in European politics after this. And secondly, and really encouragingly, I think we need to start talking about these cases, um, not simply as an rule of law crisis in Central and Eastern Europe, which is maybe the dominant European Union discourse, 
but we should start talking about Romania, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Poland, Czech Republic. These are all cases and states that have seen huge mass demonstrations for democracy. Um, in all five of those cases over the last two or three years, mass civic mobilizations that have been widely reported as the biggest since um, 1989. So I, I think we really need to urge um, Democrats across the whole of Europe and in Brussels especially to maybe flip how we're talking about the European uh, democratic crisis and say rather than saying um, Central and Eastern Europe is the heart of the rule of law crisis perhaps we should be talking about it as the heart of the democratic uh, upsurge the new democratic spring which is challenging authoritarian protectionism. Great, thanks very much, Luke. Uh, Bill Yarnim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the um, London School of Economics and Political Sciences for inviting me to contribute to this uh, very interesting and very timely uh, topic, I should say. I will be talking from a practical point of view uh, working in the area of uh, judicial and legal reform and anti-corruption for more than 20 years now. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, completely agreeing with uh, what Dr. Cooper uh, said uh, before me that uh, uh, we should uh, we should start talking more about Romania, Bulgaria, and Slovakia, Slovakia, and the other countries from southeastern Europe. Uh, because in Bulgaria, the situation uh, is not uh, uh, more different than in Poland and Hungary, if not uh, worse. So we have, uh, uh, since 2009, for the last 12 years, um, uh, the same uh, party uh, governing the country in uh, various, uh, uh, in various combinations and with very... Um, uh, small gaps uh, in between with caretaker uh, governments. And uh, the peak of this uh, creeping authoritarian regime, as I call it, uh, uh, started uh, with the last uh, uh, government, uh, Borisov III, uh, from 2017, in uh, which uh, uh, GERP, this is the name of the ruling party, married uh, to the uh, far right, uh, labeled here as uh, uh, um, patriotic nationalistic uh, uh, coalition, and uh, ruled for the last four years. Uh, the culmination of this uh, ruling was uh, the deepening of the capturing of the state uh, uh, in all various uh, ways, uh, capturing of the media, capturing of the judiciary, and uh, capturing uh, of the regulators. We are currently also uh, uh, witnessing uh, a step-by-step -step capturing of the academia, uh, but uh, I really hope that uh, this will uh, not, uh, uh, not happen in such a deep way as it is uh, happening in Hungary, for example. Uh, the other outcome from this, uh, um, from this uh, marriage uh, was also the institutionalization institutionalization of the corruption uh, in the country, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the legislative, the parliament uh, was uh, serving the needs of the executive uh, and uh, producing legislation which uh, basically legalized uh, corrupt uh, schemes uh, in all various uh, ways, including also uh, fraud, uh, and uh, um, violation of the main procurement uh, uh, principles. So as Dr. Cooper said, uh, this uh, led uh, uh, first in 2013 uh, to a very large protest, uh, which continued for more than a year and uh, led to the establishment of a caretaker government. Uh, last year in the summer of 2020, um, a second large protest uh, uh, started and I can say that it still continues, but this time it was uh, different. Uh, it was uh, led mainly by young people, people who have returned to the country due to the uh, COVID-19 situation all over the world and who were demanding um, a transparent and accountable uh, governing and transparent and accountable institutions. What, uh, uh, what made uh, this um, 
uh, protests uh, unique uh, for the European Union, I must say, is uh, that uh, the second uh, demand of these uh, people, of, of all of us, I was also protesting on the streets, um, uh, was the resignation of the prosecutor general in the country. I haven't heard uh, of a member state uh, where uh, people have protested for the resignation of a person who is part of the judiciary. And in Bulgaria, the prosecutors are part of the judiciary. So you might ask yourselves uh, why, why, why this is like this. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the answer is that in Bulgaria, the prosecutor general uh, is, um, let's say, the most powerful figure uh, regardless if we talk about the executive, the legislative, uh, or the judiciary, uh, because it really has um, very broad powers. Uh, um, uh, it has a seven years of mandate, and uh, there is no mechanism to hold uh, this person accountable, uh, a topic which uh, was criticized uh, by the European Commission on various occasions in the CVM reports and also by the, uh, by the Venus Commission's, uh, Commission and other European institutions. Um, and here I want to, uh, to, to mention also something uh, which uh, um, I believe should be underlined and perhaps might bring to a further discussion. Uh, I, in my opinion, there is a difference uh, between uh, what is going on in Central Europe and what is going on in South and Eastern Europe uh, and also in Bulgaria. And I will try to illustrate this uh, uh, with the saying we say in, uh, we have in Bulgaria, which is that uh, a bald head is not cut by a sword. And uh, by this, uh, I would like to say that uh, in all these years, in 2007, uh, the Bulgarian uh, uh, government uh, uh, has managed to keep a low profile and uh, has very quickly learned how to satisfy uh, the European Commission and the other European uh, institutions. And that is why the, the, monitoring, uh, um, the monitoring and the evaluation of the process in, in Bulgaria uh, were not uh, so strong uh, as perhaps in Hungary and in Poland and did not, uh, uh, did not uh, uh, lead to, uh, to such uh, measures, such harsh measures, which are currently taken against uh, Hungary and Poland. Uh, having said this, uh, as I also mentioned in the beginning, this doesn't mean that the process in Bulgaria are not uh, even, uh, even deeper than in the other countries from Central Europe. Uh, all this um, uh, creeping authoritarian regime uh, basically created in Bulgaria something uh, which um, I would like to call democracy without the content. Because uh, um, uh, let's say uh, the European institutions in the EU uh, can only function at its best when uh, the institutions uh, at the national level are functioning in a transparent, accountable and efficient way. And if you have uh, institutions like in Bulgaria, which uh, in most of their parts are corrupt, not accountable and not uh, functioning in a transparent way, this is projecting also on the European institutions institutions. And this is why I believe uh, uh, the, uh, the EU is uh, uh, so, so weak at the moment and uh, is, uh, is looking for an answer. And at the end of uh, my presentation, I would like uh, to uh, throw some ideas uh, which uh, perhaps can be seen also as answers to what, uh, what the European Union and what uh, all of us uh, can uh, uh, do. Uh, first of all, um, we should not be afraid uh, of, uh, um, of uh, what was said in the mid-70s by the uh, uh, Belgian Prime Minister at that time, uh, Leo uh, Tindemans, uh, about uh, the uh, Europe at uh, different uh, uh, speeds. This, uh, this is absolutely natural, in, uh, uh, in my opinion, and there is nothing to be afraid uh, of. There, should be, there will be always uh, different speeds uh, uh, in Europe, 
But uh, what we can make uh, uh, in that sense is, first of all, look for more unified uh, policies at a European level. What I mean is, uh, and I will give you the example with the European uh, Prosecutor's Public Office. Uh, this is uh, uh, something which uh, I believe is a success of the European Union and is a step uh, towards uh, the unification of certain policies uh, at, uh, at a European uh, uh, level and not only at the country uh, level. And uh, the European uh, prosecution has just started functioning on the 1st of June. And I believe that it should be even uh, more, uh, more supported. And here comes the second uh, idea I would like to throw for a debate. And this is uh, the increasing or the broadening of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Because at the moment, uh, uh, the European prosecution will be relying for its indictments uh, uh, to the national courts. However, we should find and we should we should look and we should find for a court for the European prosecution and also for other European institutions. And I believe this should be the European Court of Justice. Uh, for this, however, it will need a very solid uh, uh, political uh, political backup. Uh, on the third place um, uh, is um, the, uh, the functioning or the, the real implementation of the various uh, uh, evaluation uh, and monitoring tools which were developed through the years. And uh, here I don't mean the CVM because I believe the CVM uh, has exhausted uh, its uh, its powers. Uh, I turn more to the uh, newly established and presented last year rule of law report. And uh, I, uh, on purpose, don't call it a mechanism because so far it is not coupled with a really functioning uh, mechanism. Only once when it is coupled with some uh, some mechanism, which I'm afraid should perhaps include also some fi uh, financial uh, restrictions. Uh, only then we could really uh, we could really say that uh, uh, the rule of law report is a rule of law is is a mechanism safeguarding uh, the rule the rule of law uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, last but not least, as a fourth idea, I would also like to throw um, the potential which I believe exists uh, in the uh, Conference on the Future of uh, Europe uh, uh, initiative. It is uh, labeled uh, uh, as a major pan-European exercise, but I really do hope that it will not, uh, uh, not remain only an exercise, but what will come up uh, from from it will turn into uh, real uh, EU uh, policies uh, which will uh, unite uh, and not divide. And going back to the um, uh, notion for the different speeds, as long as we uh, look at the same direction and not look in different directions, I uh, don't think that there will be a problem moving with different speeds. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Biliana. We'll go next to Rafael. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to this discussion. Uh, I would like to say I, I agree with, with the pre previous speakers. Uh, we, we are talking about a, a global um, issue. Um, but I think the Polish case is, is a little bit special and, and, and I hope it does not sound too nationalistic, if, if I say that. Um, well, uh, why is that? I think Poland uh, has been uh, often referred to as a successful example of, 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 of democratic uh, transition, of, of, of democratic transformation uh, uh, over the last three decades. It, it has often been referred to as the model of um, mm, of, of, of positive uh, uh, democratic transformation. And, and I think in, in, in a way Poland has, has demonstrated that some of the um, assumptions of, of the science of uh, uh, democratic transformation uh, have been weak. Um, I think some of the assumptions uh, that we uh, mm, 
uh, that we witnessed, that we experienced in, 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 in Poland uh, and elsewhere, uh, especially in the 90s and, and especially on, on the part of the so-called liberal elites. Um, uh, I, I think a big a big part of of, of, of those assumptions uh, amounted to uh, um, to a linear model of uh, transformation. So something that takes us from point A, point A to point B, um, and it, it, it's it's a process that is a, a one way process, a one a, a one way street, so to say. Um, and I think what what we have seen in in, in the last years is uh, is the opposite of that. Uh, I, I think we have uh, what we have seen, what we have witnessed, uh, tells us that uh, democrat democratic transformation is is not a one way street, uh, and, uh, and 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 this assumption uh, has been proved wrong. And I think uh, since at least. 2015, we, 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 we could talk uh, um, about a crisis of democratic culture uh, and democratic values in, uh, in, in the case of Poland. But if we look at the electoral campaign, the presidential campaign last year in, in, in 2020, um, I think we could really talk about a breakdown of democratic culture and, and democratic standards of uh, of political discourse at the very mainstream of uh, of, of democratic debate and what uh, what 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 the um, what the campaign last year amounted to really uh, what what was the vilification of minorities. Uh, it was very much focused on the vilification of, uh, um, of LGBT people. Uh, and it, it was very much uh, focused on, on playing the anti-Semitic card. And um, I, th I think for, for many different reasons, this is, this is striking and, and, and shocking to, um, to note in the 21st century in, in, in the heart of Europe, uh, that a, a, a successful uh, mm, political campaign uh, could could really focus so much on um, on such tropes, uh, and I I also want to to uh, to touch about uh, to touch upon the, the the issue of internationalization of nationalism, which is of course a paradoxical mm, phenomenon. Uh, but if you look at the so-called Independence Day march in Poland uh, every year on the 11th of November, mm, mm, it's a march organized by far-right nationalist groups, which started as a, as a small event, but it became bigger and bigger every year. Uh, and, and, and by now it, it, it became the biggest uh, far-right nationalist uh, event uh, in Europe or probably in the world. Uh, and interestingly and, and paradoxically, it is no longer just a Polish event because it, it, it brings together far-right nationalist and racist groups from all over Europe and beyond. Mm, and I think it, it, it symbolizes and illustrates this, this really paradoxical uh, uh, aspect of, of the internationalization of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the far right movement. But uh, the internationalization uh, of, of, of the far right is not only illustrated in, 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 in terms of street, street marches. It is also illustrated on the level of um, parliamentary politics. And and I, I I actually want to uh, to mention the role of the of the British Conservative Party in 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 this uh, because uh, well that was relatively well, well covered uh, you know the, the role that the, the, the British Tory Party played in in in, in uh, forming alliances uh, uh, with 
far-right groups in the European Parliament before Brexit. Uh, but let's not forget that after Brexit, uh, Britain still remains uh, a member of the Council of Europe, which includes the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly. And uh, if you look at the composition of the political groups within the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, I think few people realize that the, the British Conservative Party is there in one group, in alliance, so legitimizing far-right uh, parties from, uh, uh, from across the continent, including Germany, uh, including Poland and, and Italy and, 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 many, other, and many other countries. Um, so I think, I think this aspect is relatively, um, uh, you know, it is it is it is still relatively under researched, and uh, um, and I, I think it should be it should be talked about much more. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Rafael. And uh, now we will move to our final speaker, Luisa. Great, thank you. I feel so tempted to react to what everyone said before me um, that I'm now you know having this uh, dilemma whether to do that first or to get, go straight to to my couple of bullet points. But just to say one thing on the party politics aspect of that, and this is obviously that um, far-right parties that have gotten the chance to be part of a government, that's been the case in Bulgaria, but also in other countries in the region, do have this spillover effect of their agendas on the mainstream party. And I think this is the one dangerous thing that probably um, also um, Dr. Cooper has looked into in his paper. I haven't looked at um, it yet. Uh, but it's also something that's worthwhile looking at because these parties are not necessarily representatives of mainstream um, attitudes and values in the societies. And I want to highlight this particularly because it's very easy to otherwise, you know, fall in the trap of this singular story. Very often when you read the news on our um, countries, on our region, what is striking you is always it's either the worst in whatever. So it's either the most corrupt, the poorest. Uh, you know, where the rule of law is the worst, et cetera, et cetera, which doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile paying attention to. But I just want to highlight once again that um, just like we don't put an equation between uh, Putin and the Russians, we should also not do um, the same thing when we talk about, uh, you know, parties, um, some political elites and the people of a certain country. Um, and so when you look at the electoral results um, in the Bulgarian case for the couple of, uh, for, for especially the last elections, this small coalition of far right parties, they, did, they didn't even make it to um, make it to parliament, which I think is pretty much of an, of an of, of, you know, um, speaks for itself. I see a growing body of research that is trying to make a segmentation within the body of voters for certain parties that we call, you know, conservative slash far right. I've seen a segmentation di uh, done actually by, by um, an LSE team that looks specifically also in the votership of Fidesz to actually show that not all of them approve of all the, um, you know, all the, the, the crazy ideas that Orban uh, has in terms of attacking minorities. Um, and so I'm a political scientist by training, but by heart, I'm a civic educator. So I have to start talking about um, something that uh, already um, uh, Rafael talked about, and this is namely um, the focus in the years of transition. There was this um, trichotomy um, that you, so not that, uh, sorry, dichotomy. You had to focus in the years of transition on the elites. So they, um, part of them were already westernized if they were part of the diaspora, but they had to sort of embrace the liberal idea. So the focus was on basically getting the elites be democratic themselves. And the second one was the focus on the institutions, making institutions um, democratic, refurbishing them. But the one missing link here is the people. So how do you expect to have liberal democracies in countries where people are predominantly um, socially conservative? And so one of the, or some of the reasons for the backlash vis-a-vis um, -vis the Istanbul Convention or certain policies or initiatives that are rather progressive, um, or I mean, you would call them progressive, um, is simply that uh, people, you know, the, their value set is simply not, 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 not there yet. 
um, you have to um, lead part of this back to, um, you know, this policy or politics of uniformity of communism where everyone had to be the same. So in a way, um, you have to put an extra effort in educating diversity and multiculturalism after 89. And so if there has been no focus on people and there is values and attitudes and, and, and skills, and there has been hardly civic education, neither in the formal nor in the non-formal sector, you cannot necessarily expect people to have those, um, you know, to have those civic competences that are needed uh, to be able to, to, you know, to embrace uh, 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 an Istanbul Convention. Um, some of the other, um, you know, if I'm trying to basically describe the Bulgarian soul or in a way, you know, the Eastern capture, the Eastern European soul. The other aspect of it is a notion of, I would call it social jealousy. So in somehow Bulgarians, but I think also other Eastern Europeans didn't really experience in the 90s and in the 2000s, a sort of a policy of recognition, you know, no, there was such a level of insecurity that you all had to run to the fortune tellers to tell you what's going to happen. And so um, no one really came to say, you know, well done. And you see also this type of, um, of, of, of behavior then translating also in, uh, um, in, 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 in voter turnout. Look at the um, voters of the Alternative for Germany, for example. They predominantly, as you know, come also from the Eastern uh, bon Bundes um, republics. So the social jealousy basically um, uh, leads to the fact that many in our countries have these very strong negative sentiments towards the Romani on the first place, then comes to um, migrants, for example. And this is because you feel like um, they have been given more attention. They are receiving more on the social end. And this makes you, or this reinforces this sense of anyway, it's being second hand, second hand in the European Union, and now all of a sudden again, you know, because of minority politics. So um, uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the positive side of all of this, as I said, um, it is also full of a lot of paradoxes, um, but also does not necessarily translate in any, uh, uh, you know, election behavior, electoral behavior that would put these parties, at least uh, uh, in the Bulgarian case, uh, much further, much further up. And then um, I, the one thing that I would keep playing for, um, both when it comes to supporting civil society in our region, but also when you think about what European institutions could be doing, is um, on the one hand, do not forget the role of humanities, because this is where you get to learn um, civic competences and civic behavior. And when you look at, you know, um, educational policies, which are not necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, a question of the institutions, but are a question of where you put an emphasis within employability politics of the EU, always directed um, into the STEM skill set. And so humanities are always put, put to the side, but that's very important. And this is why the focus of, you know, the Kaczynski's and the Orban's is going in this direction. It's going in the direction of how you, how you set up your museums. It's going in the direction of how does your history curriculum look like? It goes in the direction of uh, who's holding um, the authority on the textbooks, and so um, you know that's that's I think part of part of the part of the answer. And then last but not least, um, in a way, you know, because I'm also part of civil society, it does start to feel like cultural wars in a way. But I keep asking myself, and I don't have an answer to this question. What is our role really in civil society? Is it um, to educate? Because that's what we kind of have been doing since the 90s. Or is it to represent? Because if we were to represent, then we're actually not very representative. Uh, and so I'm leaving it here. Um, and I look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Louisa. And thank you, everyone, for their interventions. I think the first thing we're going to do now is allow all the speakers an opportunity to engage with some of the uh, the points of their fellow speakers while uh, those in the audience are, are thinking about what kind of uh, questions they'd like to pose themselves. Um, and uh, just before we go back to our speakers, uh, maybe just a, a couple of words um, uh, from, from me. Clearly one interesting uh, theme that we may want to talk further about is the extent, extent to which we're dealing 
with a single phenomenon here. This is, of course, the, the claim that uh, Luke has, uh, has framed the discussion with. And I get the impression that, by and large, there is a, something of a consensus on the panel that we can talk about a, a general phenomenon here, albeit with uh, a series of asterisks uh, concerning how it plays out in particular countries. Uh, Biliana, for example, mentioned the, the tactics of uh, uh, whether in Bulgaria there is an effort to avoid provoking transnational institutions, for, for example, that makes it go somewhat more under the radar. Um, a couple of questions I would simply add into, in addition to anything that you want to talk about. What is authoritarianism, protectionism replacing, if we, if we go with this uh, concept? Um, is it taking over from uh, neoliberalism? Um, or is it a kind of uh, refocusing of neoliberalism from a globalist to something more like a nationalist orientation? To what extent is this a break with a certain kind of economic model or a kind of redesign of it for, for different purposes? And uh, as I guess another general question that I'd be interested to, to, to touch on, to what extent if we again run with the concept of authoritarian protectionism as a kind of umbrella category, is this a stable ideology? Are we talking about something which can persist in its current form or is it uh, inherently radicalizing or in transition to some other type of, uh, of, of politics? How will it contend with its own challenges or limitations. We heard Rafael talk about, you know, the, the idea of an internationalist nationalism, which clearly seems ripe for, for tensions as well as potentially um, quite a, a productive uh, politics for those engaged in it. But there are also clearly economic tensions that are likely to come to fore over, over time. Are we talking about a stable formation or are we talking about something that is in a kind of uh, perpetual evolution? And, and if so, where is it going? That's just my tuppence worth, but I'd like to go back to um, our, our speakers to see if they have anything that they want to pick up on that others have mentioned in, in the course of the discussion so far. So let me go first back to Luke. Thanks, and thanks to all the speakers. That was, um, it's really great to uh, have this conversation. Um, so in reference to the, this question of what is authoritarianism, protectionism, if, you, if we use the framework I've advanced uh, that uh, Jonathan asked, uh, what's it replacing, what's it taking over, uh, is this a break or redesign of the economic model, I would say that this politics is quite a big departure from neoliberalism uh, in two uh, different respects. On the one hand, I think classical neoliberalism ideologically uh, made a very strong meritocratic, aggressively meritocratic argument in its mobilizing discourses. And that went something along the lines that uh, if you work hard and you uh, engage with the market and you're a bit selfish, you know, you, you look after your family um, and you try to get ahead and you compete in the market, well, society will be good for you. Uh, I think the politics that we're confronting in a lot of countries, and it's not the same everywhere, I think there's a little bit of what I've just advanced in Modi's argument about the Indian middle class rising. It, it comes across very, it has this very strong individualistic element, which is has resonances with uh, classical neoliberalism. I, I would say in most countries, we get a different set of distributional claims. And I think that's because when inequality reaches very, very high levels and perhaps the market is not performing in a way that many people expect it to perform and certainly not uh, the uh, ideologues of neoliberalism originally argued um, when markets are seen as dysfunctional, I think politics has to adapt to that and we get a different claim that's put forward. And the claim that's put forward broadly um, is that you have a certain set of distributional rights because of your ethnic uh, status. And that's not meritocratic, it's actually unconditional. Uh, you, you don't have to do anything to access this set of um, rights. Do I think, and, and I wanna hear what the rest of the panel say, um, so I'll just very briefly, do I think it's a stable phenomenon? Can it last? I think, I think it is a stable phenomenon probably, and I think it will define our politics for quite a long time to come and the resistance to it will define that politics too and the challenge to it. Um, and the reason for that 
is that I think it falls back on something that's very visceral in many societies, and that's the feelings that nationalism and national identity attract. It, it, this is a very default register, if you like, for this new politics. And I think because nations and nationalism are going to be with us for many generations, at least still to come, I think it has a very kind of organic um, tendency. Um, and I just wanted to say I agree with Rafael about uh, the Polish case to some degree, um, especially if you contrast Poland to Hungary. Um, and so in Poland, the far right have really built huge street mobilizations in a way that Orban's not really interested in. It doesn't have that kind of same active political engagement um, on the streets and with street mobilizations. And that has allowed law and justice, to, as you describe, to put itself at the center of this kind of far right civil society, if you like, that's emerging across Europe. Thank you, Biljana. <clears throat> uh, to the question, uh, what uh, authoritarian uh, regime is trying to replace? Uh, um, I believe it is trying to replace uh, the lack of security. Uh, very simply said, uh, because uh, uh, through these uh, democratic neoliberalistic uh, processes, uh, uh, people uh, here, and not only here, I believe, uh, have, uh, have lost uh, their sense uh, for security. Uh, before, during the socialist communist times, uh, everything was uh, uh, pretty much regulated, uh, even over-regulated. And it provided that certain level of security. However, now uh, having a market economy, having all these uh, other features of the neoliberal democracy, people have lost this uh, sense of security. And this is what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, makes them uh, 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 even more conservative uh, than before. Uh, we have uh, seen this uh, disbalance uh, uh, opening of the scissors, uh, so uh, bright, uh, uh, very uh, rich people, very poor people, and in between there is no middle class, which usually in a normal market, you know, uh, economy and developed uh, democracy provides this level of security. So that is why I believe uh, 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 almost naturally people are turning uh, again to looking for the very strong, powerful figure, uh, which, uh, uh, which can bring them uh, this type of security. And uh, going back to what uh, Dr. Cooper said about the uh, meritocratic principle and meritocracy, uh, we, we haven't reached to that point yet in Bulgaria. Uh, we uh, uh, people uh, who are on the decision making, decision taking, and leadership positions uh, in the country, uh, regardless if we talk about the executive or the judiciary, uh, even though they are elected through uh, public procedures, these procedures are not transparent and they are not elected because of their skills and capabilities, they are elected because of, uh, uh, of nepotism and uh, other um, hidden uh, connections. And this uh, transforms and projects uh, on the government and on the decision taking and on the well-being uh, of the country. So um, basically uh, this, uh, this lack of security and uh, uh, I, I can also add to the very high speed of development of the democracy in the country was too, uh, uh, too uh, big a thing to swallow for the people here. And we are not there yet where, for example, Poland and Hungary are. So that is why I said that uh, uh, things are different in Southeastern Europe than in Central Europe, although they lead to the same result being a threat not only for the rule of law, human rights, but a threat uh, also for the very democratic principles of the EU. And uh, uh, the fact that we are uh, geographically on the periphery of the European Union should not mean that we should be left uh, politically uh, and from a social point of view also in that periphery. And uh, just to add to uh, what Louisa mentioned about uh, uh, perhaps the role of the civil society here. Uh, the civil society is the or, or active 
uh, uh, active civil society uh, organizations and persons are these uh, who can actually uh, try to bring back again that security, but without uh, leaning to the authoritarian and uh, far right and populistic regimes. Thank you, Rafa. Uh, well, that's that's really interesting. I, I I'd like to um, to respond to uh, to 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 one or two uh, points that that were made. Um, I think it would be interesting to uh, you know to focus a little bit uh, on on the context of the pandemic. Um, and uh, if we think back to March last year. The Polish government was one, one of the first to close the borders. I think it was an instinctive reaction to the pandemic, uh, which, which may have been justified um, and it may have been a, a right decision, uh, but I think in some ways you, you, you could call it an instinctive uh, um, um, uh, response dictated by authoritarian protectionism. Um, or protectionist authoritarianism, if you like. Uh, um, and you might think that this kind of response would have served the ruling party okay. Well, yes and no, because what we have seen in, in the last months is the, um, is, is, is the relative success of the um, of the political groups to the right of the ruling party, uh, those groups uh, that uh, spread conspiracy theory around the pandemic, in, including anti-Semitic conspiracy theory around, around the pandemic, uh, that have capitalized on the pandemic situation in, in a different way. Uh, so I think uh, through um, legitimizing far-right discourse, the ruling party uh, mm, sort of got the genie out of the bottle and it is very very uh, challenging and, and, and very difficult to get it back into the bottle uh, so I think what what the ruling party in, in Poland is, is is facing today through a lot of the mistakes that uh, they have made in in terms of legitimizing different types of far-right discourse they are now facing a, a challenge uh, from from parties that are even more nationalistic or more uh, uh, more authoritarian uh, uh, to to the right of the ruling party, and and I think that is um, uh, that is one of the paradoxes of, of of the current situation. I also want to mention. Um, uh, well, Luisa alluded to, to 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 the issue of humanities, and and I think I can relate to it to to that. Um, uh, you know, thinking about the, the, the broader issue of education as well as higher education in Poland today. So I, I know that may be uh, sounding shocking to you, uh, but let me quote uh, one, one politician who, who, um, who played the big role in, in, in the presidential campaign last year, uh, who said repeatedly uh, and, and, and publicly, uh, about uh, on, on television about uh, LGBT people, he, he said, uh, these are not uh, normal people. Let's uh, stop uh, all this nonsense uh, uh, about human rights and equality. And it, 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 it's a precise quote. Uh, a, few, a few months later, he was rewarded with a, with, with, with a post of uh, ministry, Minister of Education. And, uh, and he is running the Ministry of Education and Higher Education today. And he is uh, rapidly uh, changing the, 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 the school curriculum uh, as, well as, uh, as well as rules of, uh, uh, of, of, of higher education in, in institutions, uh, uh, which I think shows uh, how directly uh, the, you know, the far right can affect and, and undermine the, the very principles, the very fundamental principles of the, um, uh, um, of, 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 of education uh, understood as, as, as a humanist, uh, um, as, as a humanist uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, 
and uh, and and i i'm afraid uh, you know we 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 are facing uh, this 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 challenge uh, in a in a very direct way in in a very crude way and of course we can you know we, we can have a very refined uh, intellectual uh, debate about it but at the end of the day we are we are faced with with some very crude and and and, and very direct and, and 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 very radical challenges here thank you thank you Avril. and finally louisa Right, thank you. Um, I think I heard Biliana say this, uh, but to your question, what is this, um, what is this far right tide replacing? I think it really um, gives an answer to the sense of fear. And I think we're at a moment in history where um, all of a sudden people are more anxious and more afraid of the future than of the past. But when you look at democracy and all our institutions, they're actually based on the premises of the never again of the past. But now suddenly the past becomes so comfortable um, that it's like that actually you're much more afraid of what is what is coming. And then um, I'm sorry that I keep coming back to the skill set, but I don't think people have acquired the skill set that is helping them get through this constant sense of transformation. So and it's a constant sense of transformations, but also of, of, of crises. And even if in our circles we're calling these things challenges and try to look for the opportunities, people are really afraid. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of all the changes that are happening. And so what you're trying to do is you're looking for the roots. And then it's also a natural reaction, human reaction, to look for, you know, the uniformity. So you look for what you're, what you, what you, what you're acquainted with. We look with you for the things that you're comfortable with. And so this makes it rather easy for, um, you know, all those uh, uh, quite simplistic, but yet um, apparently very successful uh, messages of different either populists or then um, also far, far right parties. Whether um, this is a stable, um, a stable uh, trend, um, I think it's pretty difficult to predict. Um, and I think also indirectly answering one of the questions in the chat, I think Comparison is good for making sure that probably you know countries do not fall out of out of, of out of people's agenda and, and, and attention. But then they should be also taken case by case because there are differences. Um, so and here again, I think we should look into the different countries and try to understand really how deeply rooted have these um, elites and parties uh, um, um, gotten to be? Um, and also what is the type of opposition that they get from, um, uh, you know, from, 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 from civil society or society that is differently minded? Because as earlier, um, uh, Bilana pointed to the protest waves in Bulgaria. I think this was a really um, lucky coincidence and a perfect storm um, in the sense of, the pandemic kept people uh, at home for many months, plus a lot of young people um, whose obviously mindset has been changed while they were studying abroad came back at, came back home. And this is also one of the reasons why people took it to the street, not only in Sofia, but also in other cities across the country. Because I can tell you from a civic health index that my organization has just um, uh, developed, um, the... the it is a minority of Bulgarians that actually recognize protest as a meaningful way of changing uh, anything in society. Bulgarians say that they're ready to go to vote. It's like the majority of people recognize elections as the instrument of civic participation. But then for quite some time, no other instrument comes to their mind, which gets me back to the, you know, to the civic competences and why I think they're, they're so crucial. Great, thanks very much. So we've got some questions coming in from the audience and what I plan to do is the following. I'll cluster a few questions and then I'll let uh, speakers intervene as they would like on, on the questions that uh, they uh, particularly want to uh, come back on. So let me uh, read out, um, uh, I think, three questions to begin with, which are accumulating here in, in the chat. The first one, from uh, Dimitrina Ivanova, who writes the following. While I understand the emphasis on external EU institu institutional solutions in the case of Bulgaria, 
I wonder about the extent of domestic and more local democratic solutions. Are the latest election results a realistic opportunity for dismantling of captured structures, or perhaps due to the nationalistic character of the possibly would-be winners, we are still witnessing more of the same threats to democracy that Dr. Cooper talked about. So a question there, I guess, on the, the balance between um, EU responses and uh, local domestic responses. Um, I have a, another question here from uh, Joshua Tal. Is it possible to effectively delegitimize authoritarian protectionism given the prevalence of insular communities and paradoxically pan-European nationalist groups? What would delegitimization look like in this context? And then thirdly, uh, from someone called Xin Zuo, how should European democracies respond to many voters' disillusionment with democratic values, which partly contributes to the rise of far-right ideology? So I take that to be a question which touches on a number of points people have made about uh, underlying attitudinal bases of the, uh, the appeal of the uh, political currents that we're talking about. So uh, any of our speakers who would like to come in on one or several of these questions, um, please uh, gesticulate wildly and I will uh, hand over to you uh, or otherwise I will go around one by one. But does anyone want to come in first on any of these? Well, I can if you like. Well, I'll I'll say on the, in reference to the local and international response, and it relates to something that Biliana uh, said earlier, um, the European Public Prosecutor's Office is a really a big step forward for fighting corruption in Europe, and Europe really needs such a step forward. I mean, its anti-sanctions uh, regime for corruption is much weaker than the Magnitsky sanctions regime in the United States. It doesn't have anything equivalent to Magnitsky sanctions uh, for corruption. So this is a really important institutional development. And with a Romanian taking becoming the European head public prosecutor, this is a really nice example. And I put a link that expands on this uh, in the in the chat. This is a really nice example of change coming from the periphery to the center of Europe, a mass public pressure for action and protest against the social democratic regime, public prosecutors um, in uh, Romania playing a really strong role in really pushing a number of um, uh, anti-corruption cases um, against politicians. So you see civic mobilization working in tandem. Um, and so it's, so it's a positive that we, that we should um, generalize. And the other comment I was going to make, um, I think that I think relates to this and what Louisa has just said. Um, you, you're, it's really interesting to hear, and yeah, it's been a fascinating conversation for me to hear about all of these examples. But your comment about the civic health index that you've um, established, and um, Bulgarians uh, showing um, more support for elections as a civic act compared to protest. It just reminds me a lot, I know it's a very different case, but it does remind me a lot of the research I did in Hong Kong, where for a long time there was this tremendous, um, huge civic mobilization in terms of participation, but it was always a really active minority in society in the sense that for most people who are pretty cautious pretty small c conservative weren't very keen to rock the boat but it was over time with the course of events that that civic mobilization really started to dominate the politics of the country and i was going to ask you is there um is there a sense in which something akin to that i know the hong kong case has a very a bad ending, if you like, but leaving that to one side. Um, is there something similar perhaps in Bulgaria in the sense that this civil society protest movement, which even might at some point find a political outlet? And the very last point is that I think the way that corruption is talked about in Central and Eastern Europe is a really important, com important compared to Western Europe, i.e. especially in a country like uh, ours, uh, the UK, you know, if you mention corruption in politics, that's considered a disgraceful act. In a lot of European countries, to get into politics, the first thing you need to do is to say you're against corruption. And so the way that the debate is framed, I think, is, is much better on your side than on than on our side, because, uh, you know, if you're living in a political context where 
mentioning corruption is kind of forbidden in public debate. You are presumably at risk of allowing corruption when it happens. Thank you, Luke. Hello. If I can add a couple of words, okay. Uh, on the on the question about uh, uh, about uh, the values, uh, and I also saw in the the, the Q and A part something about what the EU should uh, should do. Uh, so perhaps uh, the European Union should uh, think of uh, uh, rebranding itself uh, somehow. Because uh, at the moment, uh, it looks like uh, it does not uh, uh, do what it is preaching. We talk, uh, or the EU talks about the union of values, but uh, when it comes to establishing really functioning mechanisms to keep these values, we suddenly see that the values have a price tag and that uh, countries like ours or Poland and Hungary can kind of uh, circumvent uh, all these procedures and continue to be uh, taking part in the, the whole decision taking and decision making processes on the, uh, at, the, at the European uh, institutions. Uh, the other thing which uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to, to mention and also present as a concept, uh, something which uh, we have uh, uh, discussed with other colleagues here in Bulgaria working in the area of judicial and legal reform is uh, uh, the fact that uh, when we don't have public institutions uh, which are really representative uh, and uh, working for the public interest, perhaps we should turn uh, to the court and talk uh, uh, about judicial populism in the positive, uh, in the positive way of populism. Uh, because the court, if not a representative institution for the public, can still be the most uh, um, a highly qualified institution which can represent the, the values which uh, the public in our society uh, wants uh, and cherishes. That is why I have mentioned as another idea uh, the uh, the possibility to increase the jurisdiction and to broaden the powers of the European Court of Justice. And uh, I strongly believe that uh, there should be a political consolidation around uh, this idea, because uh, in, in that situation, if that happens, uh, this, uh, uh, this might um, uh, change the narrative uh, and change the discourse on the EU level and uh, bring back the faith of the of the people to the EU institutions. Thank you, Rafael uh, or Luisa. Do you want to come in on any of these points? Mm -hmm. If I may, uh, let me let me start by um, um, addressing the the, the the question of civil society. Uh, of course, it has been mentioned many times uh, over the last years that you know. One good thing about about the Polish situation is 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 is, is the existence of a, of a vibrant civil society, uh, and that includes a civil society protest against um, nationalist pop populism or authoritarianism, uh, and you know we, we have seen many spectacular. Uh, examples of of mass protest uh, against um, against certain uh, uh, certain moves or or, or certain um, certain policies, um, but I'm I'm afraid at the end of the day, when when you have this kind of mass movement, you you kind of expect success, and if you don't obtain success, I think disappointment is very bitter. Uh, and there is this kind of anticlimax, uh, which I think is 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 also important, and uh, it can also be quite um, quite negative. Um, so, so I think obviously it is very important to sustain uh, civil society, independent civil society, uh, but in itself, it it is not a solution. To, 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 to a crisis of, of, of democracy uh, or not the only solution. And uh, I also want to say, of course, for, for countries in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, countries like Poland, 
um, the European Union is a very important uh, point of reference and the European institutions are a very important point of reference. But again, I would say the, 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 the reaction to the crisis of, of democratic values from the European Union institutions hasn't hasn't really had much impact, meaningful impact, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be frank. And I think we are also witnessing a kind of anticlimax in terms of expectations from the pro-European public opinion in, 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 in Poland. Mm. But I also wanted to say something positive for once. And, and, and I thought, well, actually, we are, we, are, we are now right in the middle of the European football championships. Okay, Poland is out, unfortunately. But, uh, but I think we have seen some really good, uh, um, spectacular examples of, uh, um, of human rights advocacy from, you know, from football players. I, I think especially German players, also English players. In the, the England team um, in support of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, in, in support of the gay rights movement. And I think that is actually very important, almost as important as any reaction we could expect from the European Union institutions. Uh, um, you know, popular culture is, uh, is very significant in terms of um, uh, setting standards and uh, projecting certain values. So I think I think it's 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 a positive uh, it's it's a positive example. It's a positive tournament in in this sense. Thanks. Thank you, Rafael. I'll go to Louisa, and then I'm going to take some more questions from the audience. Louisa. Right. I took so many notes from what uh, the other panelists said uh, that I'm almost lost, <laughs> lost, and then wondering where to um, to hit it off. Um, so on, um, Luke Cooper had a question on whether protests um, got to produce any, uh, got to produce a, a kind of a party. He, a, a one directly from the protests, another and another one uh, pretty anti-systemic. And this one, the the one that I would call anti-systemic, is actually about to be the strongest party. But I'm not really sure that I would totally be in favor of this party um, putting together the next um, government, which might actually be the case. Um, so it's a party I think many like me are highly suspicious of because it's a very, um, you know, it's totally based on uh, the type of um, campaign that uh, someone like Trump would do. Um, but it's basically also doing only that. It's talking to its uh, votership through uh, um, a political talk show through uh, uh, public through through songs because its leader is a uh, is a um, you know talk show uh, person and a, and a musician and through uh, social networks and so I really don't know what we should expect from that um, from 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 that one but for that matter I think one realization for civil society has been that there is no way it um, it doesn't get in a way its hands dirty. So uh, political civil society became politicized. Um, there are uh, colleagues from civil society that are um, uh, joining politics, running for the for elected offices, and I think this has been one of the one of the one of the one of the, um, the developments. Um, then on the European institutions, how they are living, their values, and whether they are or not, I am thinking of the fact that. Um, just like um, uh, Rafael mentioned, European institutions continue to be, at least in Bulgaria, the most popular institutions at all. And so um, this is because Bulgarians do not trust their parties, they do not trust their parliament. These, by the way, are the two um, institutions um, that have the least, enjoy the least trust um, in, in society parties. Um, it's on a scale of five, I think one or two, and to make up 12%. So 12% of people trust parties. I hope there is no Bulgarian politician on, on this, on this, in this event, because they're not going to like this. And the parliament enjoyed 18%. This is um, polls from, uh, from March this year. 
But European institutions, even if there was a small setback now around uh, um, the pandemic, they still enjoy a very high trust because Bulgarians feel like these are the only institutions that can make their own politicians accountable, hold them accountable. Um, and um, I also wanted to uh, talk, um, uh, you know, this, these are kind of scattered thoughts, but one thing that I definitely wanted to mention is um, uh, how, you know, the whole notion of um, how proximity, but also travel enabled by the European Union helps fight prejudices. And I'm not saying this, uh, uh, you know, to have this uh, sort of very optimistic EU type of, uh, of speak, um, but I've been looking again at the data from the Civic Health Index that I mentioned previously. And interestingly, um, people in the capital are the most um, skeptical when it comes different forms of others versus villages um, where people are the least skeptical of others. So you can argue, of course, that in the villages you don't necessarily meet too many others. So, you know, there is no reason for you to be skeptical. But I'm thinking of exactly the opposite. In villages, you get to actually meet people and talk to people, whereas in the capital, uh, the chance that you're um, uh, encapsulated and living in your uh, Facebook feed bubble is 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 much bigger. So um, if if anything, I think um, there there might be, and I'm sure there is data on uh, the positive impact of of all the Erasmus Plus and free rail programs, etc., that are actually supporting uh, to counter counter um, counter prejudices. At the same time, I am looking at the infrastructure of some of our countries. And I can I can bet with you that these areas that uh, research calls civic deserts, so the structurally weak regions, the most remote, the most remote ones, the peripheral, the former imperial borders, they might actually end up being um, uh, the most supportive of far right ideas because they uh, tend to be remote uh, and not very very well connected, and there is hardly a possibility of exchange with um, yeah people that are of different um, different background than theirs. Thank you, Louisa. I'm going to take another three questions and then I will go back to each of the panelists who can uh, pick up what they want to from the questions and also say anything they'd like to say um, in the way of final remarks uh, on the on the topic. So I've got a G. Leslie here who, who poses a, a question, uh, touches on a theme we've um, briefly touched on to do with uh, whether this is something long term, whether this is a phase. Is this authoritarian tilt just a temporary blip, part of an electoral cycle, or a serious challenge which EU democracies and other Western democracies must challenge in a forthright manner, potentially with strong sanctions? Um, and how realistic is it to think that the tilt can be reversed? So a number of aspects there, but are we talking about uh, a phase and the, the kind of responses um, that uh, follow on from that diagnosis. I've got something from uh, Robert Anderson here saying, I think Luke Cooper's point about the flowering of civil resistance to the radical right is very important. Why is this fight back happening in this region much more arguably than in Western and Southern Europe? So uh, something perhaps we, uh, we certainly should say a little bit more about the response to uh, the politics we've been describing uh, uh, as much as the uh, authoritarian, authoritarian protectionism itself. And finally, Frank Mulhall, um, ask the following, are the panel concerned that there is an opaque peddling of radicalization strategies and disinformation online by shady and far-right groups funded by wealthy individuals, which will fall beyond the influence of democratic institutions and the law? So are there further currents beyond uh, those that we've been discussing that uh, would have to be engaged with in any uh, adequate response to the politics in question? I'm going to go back then to our panelists, and as I uh, say if you could engage with the questions that you would like to and anything else that you want to say by way of final remarks as we come up to uh, to the last minutes of the of the event Luke um yes so is it long term or a phase uh, well I would say it's a long it's long term but experience up till now demonstrates that civic movements and democratic institutions can resist this if they are vigilant and if they are active. And I think I would connect that to this civic resistance question um, 
and the as I said in response to um, Robert Anderson's uh, question in the Q and A. Um, so what? Why is this happening? Why is this mass civic resistance happening in Eastern and Central Europe? But we're not necessarily seeing the same level of mobilisation in Western European countries. I think that that's. Um, in some ways, the million dollar question, in a way, it's such a big question, it's difficult to answer. But I think it's important in the first instance to register that this has happened in Central and Eastern Europe and that we should be talking about it um, much more. And uh, I suppose one country which you would be worried about in Western Europe, obviously very influential in terms of European politics in general is France looking forward to the next elections. You know, I said some, to someone at the workshop I was at this week um, that, you know, you know, we should really be looking at and learning from and talking to civic movements in Central and Eastern Europe because there seems to be a lot more happening there on these issues that we're discussing um, than in Western Europe. And they said, well, they've got more to uh, mobilize against, haven't they? fairly innocent response and I'm just I really don't think that that's that's true I said to him you know look I mean Marine Le Pen is in touching distance of winning the next French presidential election I mean I think there's a dangerous complacency now and so I think that links back to flip back to this long term or phase question if I was to end on a positive note I would say I used to be of the view that if Marine Le Pen, and I'm not saying it's likely, I'm just saying it's it's become a possibility, does win the next French presidential election, you know, there, there is that would be certainly a huge shock to European democracy, and it would be a, a massive moment in European politics, and I hope that it doesn't happen. Um, but I think the evidence that we have in other cases is democratic institutions can uh, withstand this if publics are able and willing to mobilize in very large numbers against this authoritarian um, politics. So, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the European Union. Uh, the European Union would withstand it. There would be a great danger that some of the worst tolerances of authoritarianism would be strengthened again, but there would also be huge resistance from other democratic states. You know, we would have to push for a response that was every bit at least as significant as the far right entering government in Austria in 1999, you know, some form of diplomatic uh, sanctions and, um, and, and challenge um, to the far right taking power in France. But European institutions, I think, would be able to withstand and deal with this. So I think, you know, for a while it was in the height of the Euro Eurozone crisis and everything, migration crisis, you know, there was all this talk of the disintegration um, collapse. You know, the European Union has demonstrated that it has the power to withstand a lot of these challenges from the far right and endure. And yes, there's a danger of drift to authoritarianism, but it's not so much disintegration as both European and national fora you know, becoming centres of argument and conflict between progressive Democrats and authoritarian forces. And that seems to me will continue for many, many uh, years ahead. This is going to be a, a very much a long term politics that we're living with. Thank you, Luke. Um, Biliana. Um, I, while listening to, uh, to Dr. Cooper, uh, um, I thought about an article I, I read uh, um, in 2007 when Bulgaria became a member of the European Union and the article was uh, that uh, once uh, countries from the Balkans uh, start becoming full-fledged member of the European Union, this will be the end of the European Union uh, because it will balkanize itself uh, uh, somehow. Uh, well, uh, I uh, uh, listening to, to all the other speakers and observing the processes uh, here in Bulgaria, I can say that uh, uh, on the contrary, what is happening now in uh, in South Europe uh, might be might be the solution for for the for the problems which uh, the European uh, Union is uh, facing. 
uh, namely uh, uh, a strong uh, civil society, uh, young uh, generation which uh, uh, which uh, which is returning uh, with a change uh, uh, mindset uh, and which is uh, uh, really uh, demanding and looking for its uh, uh, representation. Uh, is it uh, just uh, um, uh, a, a single uh, a single uh, thing, or will it be a long process? Uh, I tend to believe that uh, uh, the the process will deepen. Uh, the pro I mean the process with the uh, authoritarian uh, regimes and challenging the the, the core values uh, of the European uh, Union. Uh, but uh, um, from uh, what was said previously from my colleagues and what I've mentioned in, uh, uh, in my presentation about these uh, uh, four ideas, uh, I really believe that uh, the, the key to solving, uh, to solving these uh, problems lies, um, um, uh, I, I can say, uh, a higher level of federalization. Uh, of the European Union, uh, more uh, unified uh, institutions to uh, defend uh, these uh, uh, values. Uh, judicial uh, populism in the positive uh, way, I try to explain uh, very briefly, and this uh, very, uh, very active uh, uh, civic, uh, civic uh, actors, uh, which will uh, uh, which will not uh, which will not uh, allow the processes to be to, to, to become inevitable. Uh, and one last uh, one last point uh, uh, I think Lisa mentioned about the the others and this uh, uh, otherness. Uh, we should try to change the narrative so that uh, uh, the the people uh, in the, the in the populistic nationalistic spectrum or the far right spectrum. Uh, don't think uh, uh, about us uh, as uh, the others, because I tend to get the feeling that in Bulgaria we are the others being the, the Soros Swedes uh, or the, the spice of foreign countries and so forth. If uh, we can change also this type uh, uh, of narrative and uh, avoid this labeling with the otherness, I think this is also one way to, to, to tackle all the issues which we have discussed in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, I wanted to, to return to the, to the, to the global context. Um, um, I am a member of a civil society organization, the Never Again Association, that, that also has uh, cooperation and projects in uh, countries of uh, Southeast Asia. And of course, until until un, 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 until recently, you know, we, we could talk about Poland as an example of, of successful democratic transformation, and that is much more much more difficult today um, in, in 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 the context of, of, of Thailand or or, or 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 Cambodia. You know, Poland is no longer the, uh, the the model country, I'm afraid. But I still think we have some. Um, uh, some important experiences to share. Like Luke said, uh, we have some civil society uh, um, activism that, that can be inspiring uh, uh, to, to others, uh, I think. Um, but if we, if we think about Poland, I, I, I think I'm afraid the year 2015 was the watershed. Year. And we are not just talking about electoral cycles. We are talking about a much more profound uh, change that, that has taken place. And actually, I, I'm, I'm really hoping everything I'm saying is, uh, is, is incorrect. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that, uh, that something major really, really happened and really changed in, in, in Poland in 2015. And I'm not just talking about the, uh, the, you know, the change of government and, 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 and the elections, but I'm, I'm talking about the, the impact of the European uh, refugee crisis which, as we know, did not really affect Poland directly because very few of those refugees uh, um, even intended to, uh, to go to Poland. Uh, 
uh, but it was framed in a, in a very negative way in, in, in media and in political discourse. And in re it resulted in a, uh, in a big change of, uh, of social attitudes uh, and a big rise uh, of, uh, of xen xenophobia uh, on, on a scale that we haven't, you know, we, we did not see before. And, uh, and I think we, 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 we are uh, still experiencing uh, repercussions of, um, mm, of that moment and, 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 and that very big change in, in, in social attitudes. Uh, which fuel uh, uh, nationalist populism and, and, and fuel the forces of, um, uh, uh, of authoritarianism uh, until, until today. And if you, you know, if, 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 if you ask me about, about, about future, I, I think many of us are, are uh, familiar with the, uh, the, um, the motto of, of, of Gramsci, you, 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 you need to be uh, a, a pessimist of the intellect, but an optimist of the will. Uh, the, the, there is another phrase from, 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 from a Polish commentator, uh, I don't want to mention his name, but, but, but he said, well, what, what is the difference between the, the, the optimist and, 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 the, and the pessimist? Um, the pessimist says it, it cannot get any worse, and the optimist says yeah, yes, it can. And uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm I'm a little bit of an optimist uh, uh, in in this in this context, and and I, I really hope I am um, I'm I'm wrong here. Thanks. Thank you, Rafael and Louisa. Thank you. Um, so before uh, the final um, a couple of remarks, I just wanted to um, say something that I uh, forgot in the very beginning to say um, how grateful I am for this opportunity to actually talk about Bulgaria and to see that it's two of us on, on, on this panel. I'm not sure whether this is good or bad, but to especially say um, that I think this might be also part of the fact that this is a um, Ratio Forum uh, event as well. So these, this is a, a beautiful foundation um, from and in Romania that is interested in the region. So just to say how happy I am that there are that type of um, institutions that are a kind of homegrown philanthropy that is interested in, 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 in what's going on. Um, and then to turn to um, uh, three more things. I think when we keep talking about whether, uh, you know, the people of Central Eastern Europe are racist, homophobe, et cetera, et cetera. It's a plea to both, you know, philanthropies, but also to civil society colleagues to try have a focus on what is homegrown and what is in a way imported from abroad. Because this, um, the, 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 the type of speak, you know, uh, whether we're Soros Swedes or all uh, civil society actors are, you know, living off grants, but they're basically, you know, not doing what they're supposed to, but they're just, you know, buying off beautiful apartments. It's, you know, this is not a homegrown thing. So that's been imported over social networks uh, conversations that people just basically buy off because there is the lack of critical thinking. And so it's necessary to keep this in mind because some things you can really work with them on the ground and others are to be addressed on a totally different scale. Uh, so that's the one, the one thing. The second point is um, kind of a personal obsession with the notion of self-efficacy. So if, uh, you know, all the talk of civic competences and what's important and whatnot, I think if this is the one thing we can focus on, I would tell basically, um, let's try to really empower people to a place where they're able of, um, you know, basically, uh, taking their own lead of their own own business, whether it's in critical thinking, whether it's in oh, they're making up their minds of how to vote, whom to go to vote for, um, um, uh, etc. And the third and last point um, is to also um, um, addressing one of the comments in in the chat. It is about how important it is to invest in. Um, people's power of imagination in times when they, um, they're afraid or in times of crises. Because what I have observed in this year and a half, and we kept having um, you know, capacity building programs for, um, for locally rooted um, um, active citizens you know, in villages and remote areas in Bulgaria, is that um, it's not that people don't want to you know, be the change on the local level, it's just that they lack the imagination often. And I'm thinking 
um, okay, I might be able, to, I might be willing to actually give up on civic education and become a total proponent of literature and, and whatever is actually in, in being able to boost this um, uh, power of imagination, to be able to imagine uh, different places, the future, different people's lives, uh, and then be empathic. Great. Thanks very much, Louisa. We've come to the end of our allotted time. So I would like to thank all our speakers, uh, Luke, Biliana, Rafael and Louisa, for um, some very interesting and stimulating discussion, I thought. I'd like to thank the Ratio Forum and LSE Ideas. And of course, I'd like to thank also our audience members and their interventions in the q and I hope you enjoyed the event and I wish you a good evening.